recently, I lived in Hawaii for eight months. Mm, not that Hawaii. I was living on Mauna Loa. In Hawaiian, that means long mountain. It's the largest active volcano on Earth. There it was cold and desolate. There was little evidence of any plant or animal life, and no civilization at that. I was there for a simulated Mars mission called High Seas, the Hawaii Space Exploration Analog and Simulation. For eight months, with five others, I was confined to a dome habitat, experiencing what it would be like to live and work on the planet Mars. Obviously, though, since we were in Hawaii, there's certain things about Mars that you cannot fully simulate. One being the one-third gravity that we would experience on Mars, being able to jump three times as high. Another being the dangers of living in a toxic atmosphere full of carbon dioxide and dust, which gives Martian skies their reddish color. Even though we didn't need life support in Hawaii, we still simulated that we did, and we would wear mock spacesuits whenever we would go outside for our extravehicular activities, or EVAs. In these EVAs, we would explore the geology of Mauna Loa, and we would first suit up at, to be able to protect ourselves from what would be a harsh environment on Mars. It takes a lot of time to prepare to go for a walk on Mars. Once we were suited up, we would explore the geology of Mauna Loa as if we were the first Mars explorers. We would collect data and send our results back to mission support. The geology of Mauna Loa is actually very similar to the geology of Mars. Both are an iron-rich basalt from the volcanic eruptions that has formed over time, and it creates this red, rocky, surreal-looking landscape. What we currently know about the geology of Mars is thanks to the data that we've received from the Mars rovers that are helping us prepare for the first human mission to Mars. The first mission is projected for the 2030s. Having a human presence on Mars will enable us to explore more efficiently and like we never have been able to before. Not only that, but exploring Mars is important for the long-term future of humanity. If you can take an extremely long-term view, you'll realize that eventually humanity will need a second home. And it can take 500 years for us to terraform Mars. Even though it's millions of years away before Earth will maybe become inhospitable and too harsh to live like we normally do, we can develop these technologies today and sustainable living to survive in a, an environment like Mars. These technologies are required to live on Mars. You have to be as sustainable as possible. You have a limited amount of resources that you have to make last for a long duration. You have to recycle and repurpose everything, your air, food, water, and waste. So we're trying to learn how to live in these environments. And no matter the technologies, how we propel ourselves there, or what life support systems we use, Humans will have to overcome the challenge of living in an isolated and confined environment. Our environments can have profound impacts on our health and our behavior. In one animal study with rats, they were placed in isolation, and researchers found that they had elevated levels of the stress hormone cortisol. Not only that, but they had ethanol available to them, or drinking alcohol, and the rats in isolation chose to drink more. While it's a stretch to say that being isolated will lead to substance abuse, it does demonstrate how our environments can have a profound impact on our behavior and our physiology. So at High Seas, we're trying to learn how our environments can be better designed and how we can better train our teams so that they can handle this extreme environment. There's a lot of risk in sending a small group of people on this long mission only together in this isolated, confined environment. As you can see, we lived in very tight quarters. There was a lack of privacy and personal space. We had to change our whole lifestyle from what it was normally like on Earth. For example, we were conserving water, so we could only shower for six to eight minutes per week. Another challenging aspect of living on Mars was the food. A Mars mission, as currently planned, would take about three years, so you need shelf-stable ingredients that can stay fresh for this long duration. 
We had primarily freeze-dried ingredients that we would first rehydrate to get something back to normal, and they lack some texture and flavor that fresh foods have on Earth. The other funny aspect was, even though I was in this extremely technical environment, I learned a lot about old-world-style cooking. You can't bring bread to Mars. You have to make it yourselves. So I learned how to bake bread and Neapolitan pizza while on Mars. Another very stressful aspect of being on Mars is the communication. If you're really millions of miles away from Earth, then it can take 10 to 20 minutes for a message to be delivered. This can be quite burdensome. At High Seas, we simulated this by having a 20-minute delay on all of our communications. You can't have any spontaneity in your conversations. And when people on Earth are conversing in real time, you miss out on this information, and your message comes in 20 minutes later and can create some confusion that is even more difficult to resolve because you have this lag time. So we're learning about the stressors of Mars life so we can prepare future crews that when these challenges arise, they'll know how to handle them. In sending people to Mars, there's a lot of risk, extreme boredom, or were completely irritated with each other's personal habits. One even resulted in a fist fight. But that's the extreme example. On the other side of the spectrum, crews can also be too good. If they're too cohesive, there's something called crew ground disconnect that can evolve. And this means the crew is prone to ignoring orders from mission support or not following the plans that they had from the ground. So at High Seas, they're preparing us to meet these challenges and in part trying to look to answer the questions about what's the ideal composition for a Mars crew? What combination of personalities and professional backgrounds will lead to the most high-performing and reliable crew? Most prior studies on isolation and confinement have been conducted based on questionnaires to people living in Antarctica or underwater in submarines. One theory, developed by Rohr in the 60s, says that there's three main phases that people undergo in isolation and confinement. The first phase is an elevated alertness, being in this new environment. The second phase is characterized by depression and even regret for putting yourself in that situation. The third is characterized by volatility or a high range in the emotions that people experience. Another theory developed by Bechtel in the 1990s is called the third quarter phenomena. It states that after the halfway point, the novelty of the mission has worn off, but still the crews feel like there's so much time left in the mission. So they have a tough time psychologically until they reach the fourth quarter, and then they can see that the mission end is near, the light at the end of the tunnel, and they can have an improved psychological state. Our crew definitely went through some of these waves of change. We've only been out for two weeks, so it will take some time before High Seas researchers can develop models based on our psychological states throughout the mission. But I was there, so I can tell you what I observed personally. And the first part of the mission was definitely the best. We were at this ideal state of being happy and healthy. We even said things like, how could anything ever go wrong? We're going to be like this for the entire mission. We're going to be the very best crew. And in the end, it felt like the less time we had left, the slower time was passing by. Boredom was never an issue for us, though. We were so busy with our research, the EVAs, the endless surveys about how we were feeling, and some social activities. We watched movies and played board games for some healthy competition among the crew. And it's funny to look back on my perspective before I joined the mission. Some people told me it would be like a prison sentence. Why would you do that? To me, it seemed like a retreat, a time for focused work and self-reflection. But it turns out both perspectives were wrong. It was definitely not a prison sentence, but it wasn't a retreat either. Of the eight books that I brought with me, I was only able to read two of them. Still, though, I learned a lot about myself, and I gained some valuable data about how health and stress states evolve in a very important context. As a data scientist, the amount of data that we were collecting about ourselves at high seas was extremely appealing to me. 
For my research, I'm working with advanced wearable devices such as this Jawbone Up wristband that I'm wearing. These enable 24-7 monitoring of our activity levels, our sleep duration, and sleep quality. So I'm analyzing all of these data from our eight months to develop behavioral indicators of stress and exhaustion that can be used to help us understand why our bad days occur and how they could be prevented. In Mars 500, the longest simulation to date, 520 days in Russia, 85% of the conflicts that were reported involved individuals who said in their surveys that they had a high level of stress and exhaustion. So monitoring our health is not only good for us personally, but it also can improve our relationships with each other. At High Seas, we really enjoyed having the Jawbone data, and it became another way of friendly competition among the group. We would challenge each other to see who could have the most steps or who had the best sleep patterns the night before. So you can have a supportive network of family and friends to help you reduce chronic stress. Chronic stress is a huge problem in our society today. Our bodies are built to respond to acute stressors in our responses, something like fleeing from a predator. But in our society today, we have these stress responses more constantly with the endless meetings and the traffic and being constantly connected to things that are stressful and can evoke that response. High stress and chronic stress have been related to chronic diseases such as heart disease. So it's important that we can be begin to understand how to better monitor and manage our stress levels. Some research has actually shown that how you perceive your stress is what matters. If you view it as something positive that's preparing you for a challenge, you do not have the same detrimental outcome as those who view it as something negative and out of their control. So that's why health monitoring and stress management can be so empowering. They can help us take control of our habits and control of our stress levels as a result. Just as highly trained athletes are using wearable devices to monitor all aspects of their lives, from their training regimens, to their energy levels, to their diet, so they can gear their whole life towards optimal performance and competition, so can we start to look at our lives in a more quantitative manner it is my hope that these technologies developed to help us manage stress in the dome will also be useful to your home. Thank you.